and welcome to Comics Crash Course. So, we've been talking about the Silver Age of comics for the last two weeks, which applies to mainstream comics, and particularly to superhero comics. However, as the Silver Age was doing its thing, a new genre, and with it a new publishing model, was bubbling up from underground. Underground comics are the topic of the day. This one will be a little bit long, in part because there's a lot of history and context to get through, so strap in. Now, before I talk too much about the comics in particular, it's important to set the stage, because underground comics are a direct response to the intense political and social context of the mid-1960s. So, I'll start in 1954, in part because of comics history. As you know by now, 1954 is the year Seduction of the Innocent was published, when the Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency Hearings were held, and when the Comics Code was founded. But 54 is also the year the Supreme Court heard the Brown versus Board of Education case, forcing U.S. schools to integrate. Now, by the way, Wortham's research was actually powerful in this case in favor of desegregation. 1954 is also what many consider to be the peak year of McCarthyism. In 1955, Bill Haley and his comets Rock Around the Clock hit Billboard's Top 40, which rang in the age of rock and roll. And it was also the year that Rosa Parks refused to move to the back of the bus, kicking off the Montgomery bus boycott. In 1956, In God Be Trust was adopted as the national motto as a patriotic measure to differentiate the U.S. from its atheist foe, the USSR. And then in 1957, Sputnik was launched, starting the space race. 1957 was also the year that Truman sent National Guard forces in to force Arkansas to desegregate the Little Rock School District, resulting in some of the most famous images of the civil rights movement. In 58, NASA is formed. In 1959, the Cuban Revolution occurs and Hawaii and Alaska officially become states. In 1960, JFK is elected as president and the Greensboro sit-ins begin. 1961 is a particularly intense year as the U.S. breaks off relations with Cuba, leading to the Bay of Pigs crisis, the Berlin crisis leads to the beginnings of the Berlin Wall, and military advisors arrive in Vietnam, triggering the first movements of the Vietnam War. Oh, and the Fantastic Four kicks off the Marvel Revolution. Now, in 1962, John Glenn orbits the Earth, and the Cuban Missile Crisis almost launches World War III. In 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. leads the March on Washington, and Betty Friedan publishes one of the most important texts of the 1960s feminist movement, The Feminine Mystique. Then, Kennedy is assassinated in Dallas, and Lyndon Johnson is sworn in as president. In 1964, the Gulf of Tonkin incident brings tensions in Vietnam to a head, and Johnson signs the Civil Rights Act. In February of 1965, Malcolm X is assassinated, while in the summer, the Watts Rebellion, a series of riots inspired by the LAPD's violence and racial discrimination against black people, resulted in 34 deaths. In 1966, Miranda rights were established, the National Organization of Women was formed, and Muhammad Ali refused to be drafted as a conscientious objector to the Vietnam War, and he was subsequently arrested. 1967 was the summer of love for hippies in San Francisco, but in Detroit, it was the summer of deadly race riots. In 1968, both Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy were assassinated. The shakeup in the presidential nomination for the Democrats, alongside anti-war sentiment, led to massive protests at the Democratic National Convention, but ultimately, Richard Nixon was elected to be the next president. He was sworn in in 1969. It was the summer of Woodstock, and humans stepped on the moon for the first time. That's a lot. That's a heck of a lot for 15 years, for good and for ill. And as you might imagine, all of that political and social upheaval was both led by and led to the creation of counterculture movements. These anti-authoritarian and anti-establishment movements were fomented by new media, which at the time was television, AM radio, and underground publishing. These counterculture movements included groups like the New Left, anti-war and anti-nuclear movements, environmentalism, racial and civil rights movements, gender and sexual liberation movements, and drug culture that encouraged experimentation for pleasure and for enlightenment, as well as uh, the encouragement of multiple alternative religions. These movements were buoyed by a growing underground press that published local underground newspapers and magazines like the San Francisco Oracle, the Berkeley Barb, the Other Scene, Detroit's Fifth Estate, Austin's The Rag, the Chicago Seed, New York City's Rat, Atlanta's The Great Speckled Hen, Seattle's Helix, and the Portland Scribe. Most of these newspapers would have comic sections that would print gag strips and political cartoons, 
and it's here that the underground comics are born. These underground newspapers had small print runs and were sold in local bookstores, record shops, cafes, and head shops, which are stores that sell semi-legal drug paraphernalia, like glass stores. They were, in other words, distributed directly to their audience rather than through distribution centers. Young local artists began to realize that they could make their own comics and sell them at the same locations. And they didn't have to submit to the code to do it. And so this is what we mean by underground comics. Comics that are usually, though not always, written and drawn by the same person, outside of the major studio system, printed in small runs, and sold directly to shops rather than through distributors. Their content tended to reflect the counterculture roots of the movement. It was frequently political, and when it was personal, it was often self-deprecating, confessional, and explored the questions and concerns that plagued hippie and post-hippie generations. Sexual hang-ups, self-esteem, social anxieties, drug use, all these kinds of things. Now, underground comics is both a product of counterculture movements and a kind of countercultural movement itself. I sometimes get asked what the difference between underground and alternative comics is. For me, alternative comics refers more to a kind of publishing criteria and a set of preferred sensibilities that affect genre, artistic style, and tone. Well, there might have been a moment where alternative comics was a movement. In general, alternative comics continues as a publishing tendency. Underground comics, on the other hand, I view as an artistic movement, a group of artists working with and around a set of beliefs about the meaning of art for a particular period of time. So most of the undergrounds would fit into the alternative comics purview and were published by alternative comics publishers. But I don't believe someone could now become an underground comics artist. At least not in the same way. There could be a new underground comics movement, but it wouldn't be the same as the 1960s and 70s version we're talking about today. Just like you could paint in an impressionist style, that wouldn't make you one of the French impressionists alongside Renoir or Monet. The movement and the moment has passed on. Underground comics bowled up in many places around the same time. The first few we have on record are Jack Jackson's God Knows and Frank Stack's The Adventures of Jesus Christ, which were both created in Austin in 1964. In 1965, Rick Griffin published Surfing Funnies out of Southern California. And in 1966, Joel Beck made The Prophet in the Bay Area. As you can see from the pictures I'm showing you, these are really small press stuff. Hand Xeroxed, hand stapled, print runs of a few hundred copies, what we'd call zines today. But what most people consider the true genesis of underground comics, because of its fame, success, and influence more than because it was first, happened on the streets of San Francisco in February of 1968. A then unknown artist named Robert Crumb began selling copies of Zap Comics number one. Here it is. This is a later print run. Uh, out of a baby carriage in the streets of the Haight-Asbury neighborhood. Now, my later print run is only about 15 bucks, but if you find one of the initial print run of 3500 which sold out really quickly, those could be worth something. Later that same year, Gilbert Shelton, who was also working out of the University of Texas in Austin, published the first issue of Feds and Heads. Shelton would eventually end up in San Francisco, as would many other artists. The Bay Area, in large part because of Crumb's influence uh, and what would become known as the Zap Comics Collective, became the center of the underground comics movement. Now, the content of underground comics is, by its nature, countercultural. It goes against the norms and beliefs of society at large. Many underground comics feature explicit drug use, explicit sex, nudity, and espouse political and religious views that go against the mainstream. Radical and blasphemous might get thrown around a lot, and these books are purposely meant to shock, to surprise, to be challenging and raw, to push up against boundaries and taboos. But that doesn't play well for a general public. And as such, underground comics became embroiled in scandals around obscenity laws. And two cases in particular seriously affected the movement's longevity. The first was People v. Kirkpatrick, a New York State case regarding the sale of Zap Comics No. 4. One particular story in this issue satirized American family values by imagining quality time as an incestuous orgy. Morality squads across the country attempted to arrest any store that tried to sell this issue, even though it had adults-only label on the cover. While several cases on the West Coast ended up getting dropped, one case in New York City stuck. Now, it's a rather complex case that ended up going all the way to the Supreme Court. But the ultimate legal result was that the burden of proof shifted 
onto the sellers of so-called obscene material. So the state didn't necessarily have to prove that the material was obscene, but only had to prove that the seller of the material in question knew it was obscene when they sold it. As you might imagine, a lot of stores, ironically many of them stores that sold semi-legal drug paraphernalia, these so-called head shops, decided it was safer to just not sell underground comics than to be deemed liable for obscenity. The second case was 1973's Miller v. California, which, while not specifically about comics, it led to the establishment of the so-called Miller Test, which changed federal obscenity standards. The Miller Test says that a work can be considered obscene if the following three conditions are satisfied. A. Whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work taken as whole appeals to the prurient interest. B, whether the work depicts or describes in a patently offensive way sexual conduct specifically defined by the applicable state law. And C, whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. One of the effects of this law was shifting responsibility for obscenity laws onto the states, making it much easier to prosecute obscenity cases. Again, many artists and vendors were scared off by these laws, leaving only the most famous names, like our Crumb and Zap Comics, who were big enough to weather the controversy, feeling confident in their position to make and sell these comics. The movement essentially had its teeth removed. So I'm going to end it here for today, because we're already going long. But next week, I'll introduce you to some of the big players in the underground movement. See you then.